I'm going to give you a, a piece of advice that I've taken very to heart. And it is and that I've done. I have only competed against myself. Try not to get too involved in what, you know, so-and-so is doing because it can be intimidating. And the proof is to me, I have only been here in my studio, you know, teaching when I'm able, which I enjoy mentoring, studying, working, uh, trying to, trying to, you know, get a little bit better at this, at that, you know. And all of a sudden, you know, I, I receive these recognitions that people say, I get very emotional. I said, I do because I'm not expecting them. I am just honored to be in these great shows with so many amazing artists. Welcome to the Bold Brush Show, where we believe that fortune favors the bold brush. My name is Laura Arangel Bayer, and I'm your host. For those of you who are new to the podcast, we are a podcast that covers art marketing techniques and all sorts of business tips specifically to help artists learn to better sell their work. We interview artists at all stages of their careers, as well as others who are in careers tied to the art world in order to hear their advice and insights. On today's episode, we sat down with Gladys Roldan de Moras, a Mexican artist based in San Antonio who specializes in capturing the alluring and colorful beauty of the national Mexican sport of charreria. We discuss her induction into the National Cowgirl Hall of Fame, as well as her recent award, the 2023 Frederick Remington Painting Award for her painting, Chinas Poblanas. We also discuss her recommendations for artists who are seeking to put themselves out there, the benefits of focusing on yourself and your work instead of what others are doing, and her deep love for her home culture and how painting what you love can truly lead you to unexpected success. Welcome, Gladys, to the Bold Brush Show. How are you today? I'm doing great. Thank you, Laura. Thank you for this invitation. Of course. Yeah, I'm so excited to have you on um, because I actually found your work uh, when I was investigating the Pre de West, um, which is something we're going to be talking about in, in a bit. But uh, before we dive in, do you mind telling us a bit about you and who you are and what you do? Yes, uh, well, my name is Gladys Roldan de Moras, or, you know, it's a mouthful, so however you want to pronounce it. Um, and uh, I've been painting for almost 40 years. Uh, I was uh, born and raised in uh, Monterrey, uh, in a place called Monterrey, Nuevo León, Mexico, in a place called San Pedro Garza Garcia. And I have been living in this beautiful country for almost 40 years. And uh, we live in San Antonio for the past maybe 35, and this is home. And um, I have a studio that I recently built. It is not where I live. It's about five minute drive from my house. And uh, I find it very convenient and I'm very uh, thankful to be able to uh, work in this space. But uh, I've been teaching off and on um, in San Antonio for over 30 years. Uh, now, because I am so busy with my own work, I basically mentor other artists when I'm available. Um, and, um, and that part I miss a lot. I love to be around other artists because, as you know, Laura, because you're an artist too, that it's, it can become a very lonely uh, profession, right? Absolutely. So I miss that, but uh, this is where I, I live in. And work almost every day from 7.30 to around 6.30 in the evening. Well, 6.30 in the afternoon. And then if I have a lot of work, I'll stay later. But that's uh, basically what I do. Yeah. Yeah. And I bet it doesn't even feel like work sometimes. You know, it's actually enjoyable. <laughs> it, 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 you know, it is. The only thing that is hard for me, uh, as I know, is for a lot of artists is the deadlines. The deadlines, because... Somehow a lot of us managed to be late on deadlines. Uh, but, uh, uh, you know, I was just telling somebody yesterday that uh, every t everywhere I go when I, I do take a vacation, I always take my Pashad box. And uh, it travels with me all over the place. And, um, and my mom was telling me the other day, don't work. Don't bring your push out box. We went out to the coast and don't break. And I said, you know, mom, it's not only my profession and my job, it's my passion. So I cannot travel without a push out box because it's not only what I do, it's what I love. So yeah, uh, it, it, it's, you know, it's, I'm very uh, blessed to be uh, doing something that I love. So 
Mm -hmm. Yes. And also, you know, you make so many wonderful paintings representing your culture, which is so colorful and so full of history. And it's it's so rich, like the costumes, the um, the actual equestrian activities, because you paint a lot of, you know, the the female um, charras, right, uh, of Mexico, yeah. which I had no idea. Yes, the um, yes. And I was I was like, wow, their outfits are absolutely gorgeous. Um, what inspired you to dive into your culture and represent it? Well, as you know, you know, and probably a lot of people know it at first, you know, it takes years to really <laughs> to really learn the craft. And actually, I don't even think that I've I've learned it because the more I paint, the more I realize that I have so much more to learn. But but it took me years and taking mm -hmm. workshops with a lot of wonderful artists um, that I admire. But I always was looking for my voice. Like uh, I didn't want to be a clone of somebody else. I wanted to find my own voice and a wonderful uh, artist, uh, artist and, and, and teacher. He, um, I was asking him that one day and he said, well, paint what you love and you will find your voice. And uh, one day I was studying a great artist that I admire, that I have studied for many years, which is Joaquin Sorolla y Bastida, you know, the great Spanish artist. And, uh, and I wanted to, I've always been attracted to uh, horses. You know, and and I thought, gosh, I wish I could go to uh, Spain, South of Spain, Andalusia, and and paint some of those, uh, you know, uh, women on the horses, las sevillanas, you know, whatever. And but I couldn't. And then I thought, oh, wait a minute, my grandfather's sport that he loved, uh, which is la charreria, that's my ma my maternal grandfather. And then I thought, oh, wait a minute, there is alien socharro, a Mexican uh, rodeo. Here in San Antonio, and I thought, wait a minute, I'm going to go look for those. And so I, you know, I was very blessed because there's a lot of chavos here in San Antonio. So, and there's actually what is considered the oldest uh, lienzo charro in in the United States is here in San Antonio. So, um, so I headed out there and I went to the event, and I was just, just in heaven. I was just in awe to see these. And men and women and, you know, these true athletes that ride with such fearlessness and such a training. And, and I, I just loved it. And, um, and so I started painting the subject matter. And I submitted to uh, several galleries uh, that used to represent me. But I think it was, yeah, in Santa Fe or something. And... Um, Seemed like people enjoyed it. I didn't really know what I was actually, people say I did or was doing or whatever, but, um, but uh, as to finding uh, my voice. And then I submitted uh, one, a painting uh, to the uh, American Impressionist Society, which then I was very fortunate to have win uh, Best of Show. Um, and uh, that immediately, with that, it immediately pushed me into Western art. And without knowing, uh, I didn't know I was doing this. I was just painting what I loved. And I loved it, you know, and it showed and I thought, wait a minute. Uh, La charreria is very much part of Western, contemporary Western art because a lot of people don't know that uh, Mexican charros have been in the States for many, many years. Actually, I believe the first association uh, was created in 1923 in the States of Charles. So it's a hundred years at least and much more than that. So I said, wait a minute, you know, I'm painting something that I understand, that I love, that I think I can, I can uh, open a new dialogue in Western art about it. And, uh, and then I, I started painting Charreria and then I just fell in love with the girls. You know, I, I always wanted to ride uh, more horses. I did ride some, but not as much as I wanted. And it's funny because I was just thinking yesterday, uh, my mom brought me my baby book. <laughs> and my grandmother, um, she had written uh, and that I begged and begged that I wanted a horse and I wanted a horse. And I thought that was funny because, see, I was attracted since I was a baby to this. 
So I started painting the girls and, uh, and the girls in the charreria were always a very important part, but they were more in, in a back plane. They were not as important as the, ch as, uh, as the charros. And so without even knowing it, I started bringing them to the, to a more important part. And that's what they say. And, but mostly it opened a dialogue into in contemporary Western art to know, for people to know this is very much part of Western art. Now it, it has been hard. It was hard to open, you know, to open that door and, you know, um, but it's been very rewarding and I feel very lucky uh, to have done it. And like I am, um, or still do it. Uh, like I said, I, I, I'm painting things that would open dialogue as to, wait a minute, are these just girls that are riding horses? What are they? Is this in, in it? Well, this is the national sport of Mexico, which uh, a lot of people know. Um, I have mentioned it. My grandfather very much was involved in making it, uh, uh, was very involved uh, in trying to make it the, the national sport of Mexico, which was achieved in 1930. One so there is that connection that my grant with me with uh, with my heritage. So I found that in Western art, not only the artists but the collectors are highly educated. They know exactly when you paint a Native American scene. They know what tribe, what outfit, you know, or if they're painting Western, what hat with what attack or whatever, they know it very well. Well, I didn't know it, uh, and but I knew Mexican charreria and I knew I could understand it. And, and my goal has been to represent it with uh, a lot of respect and uh, dignity as, uh, as, uh, as I should, you know? So I, I try and do that and try and educate people, listen, there is a reason for these outfits. There's a reason why they go up all to the neck. There's a reason why you don't put sequins. There's a re because there's rules and regulations. So I am trying to do my little part of keeping this tradition, preserving my heritage alive in Western art. And uh, I guess people say, well, she found a niche. No, I think the niche found me because I painted what I loved. And, and that is what I tell my friends and students, find something that you really love and you will find your voice. So. Beautifully said. Yes. Thank you. Of course. And um, I was actually doing a little bit of research too, because I, I, I'm not very aware about, you know, charreria. And I, I mean, because I didn't grow up obviously in, in a culture that had that, um, you know, cause I, I actually grew up part in Colombia, part in Miami. So I was very like far removed from, uh, Mexican culture, which I love Mexican culture. I think it's so colorful and so wonderful and has so many incredible painters. Um, and I was researching and I was so intrigued by the, the, um, scaramuzas, um, because the, the outfits were apparently inspired by the, uh, the clothing that the women wore in the Mexican revolution in the early 1900s. So I was like, wow, this is it's over a century. Yes. And let me tell you, Laura, I did not know that. I oh. have never heard that. I recently heard it from a curator of a museum mm -hmm. and she brought this up. So I, I called some um, uh, historians in Mexico because I wanted to know. And I am researching that because uh, the Escaramuza uh, is a, is basically a, uh, it's, it's very new uh, in the charreria as to be, being officially accepted. Mm. Remember the year? I'll have to figure out. Though I can't remember exactly when that year was, but it was in that far away that it, I think it was in 1953 or 58 that uh, it was finally accepted. And it started with a gentleman in, in a, one of the uh, lienzos in Mexico City that um, that wanted to put together a group of girls and it had also boys, I believe one or two boys. Uh, but I don't know if he left that, you know, he was inspired by uh, by the Adelita, 
uh, from uh, La Revolución. I don't know. Uh, so this is kind of new to me. It's something that I am researching and wanting to read more about. It makes sense. Uh, so, you know, it's it's uh, very exciting for me. And I love to get into my books and read and, you know, that kind of thing. But I believe uh, there's a lot to be learned on my side about that. You know? Yeah. Yeah. And you're also, you know, you're basically the one who's also making this information more, I guess, uh, more easy to spread because you're painting them and you're representing them in these beautiful capturing sort of ways. Like I was looking through all of your paintings on your website and I was like, wow. And I can definitely see the the influence of Soroja um, and the, you know, the wet into wet and the, the expressiveness and the freshness of the color. Um, which is so perfect for Chararia too, because it is, it is such a movement of, of so much. I mean, it is such a sport with so much movement that it definitely yes. requires that vibrant yes. freshness. Which you I know, I, I, I've been uh, very lucky to paint so many of the teams. These are teams of girls and, you know, uh, that uh, live and work and compete here in, uh, in South Central Texas. But a lot of people don't know that uh, they, uh, La Charreria with the Escaramosa, the female part of the National Sport of Mexico, is represented in over a dozen states of the United States. You know, California, Georgia, Colorado. I mean, there's so many. And a lot of people don't know about this. They think I'm painting Mexico. And usually the majority of the paintings I've done, like I'm, I'm looking at what's behind me here. Mm -hmm. All of this is San Antonio. It's a beautiful wow. Queen of the Missions church here in San Antonio called San Jose. And uh, I've uh, put them, this is a team from here. This is here in uh, close to, uh, well, it's in a little a place called Atascosa, but here is the mission again. And so I am, I am lucky to live in a, in a city which has such a richness of the Hispanic population, a uh, community that, you know, as history, uh, has been written, you know, the the uh, borders have been moved and, you know, the same uh, friars that uh, uh, built the missions way in South Mexico are the same ones that built the ones here. So I'm very fortunate to live in the city where I can represent my heritage. And, uh, and you know, I don't have to, I travel a lot to, my, to Mexico, of course, but I don't have to go there. You know, I, I can just, uh, participate in the uh, so many uh, lienzos that are in San Antonio and and find about uh, find uh, you know whatever they're doing and attend the when it's open to the public it's, it's not always open to the public so uh, I'm very lucky in that sense and I'm very proud to represent our beautiful city of San Antonio so yeah yeah and by the way your paintings of San Jose are gorgeous gorgeous Thank they're you. like eye candy you're welcome. Thank you. I recommend Thank everyone to go check them out. Um, and since it's also a video podcast, I'll also be putting some images of them so people can see them. Um, Thank you. Because, of course, because there's something about, you know, painting the facade of the of the cathedral. That's just ah, just the sun hitting all the beautiful sculptural work. Ooh. Oh, it fills me with joy. I love it. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Well, when, if you ever San Antonio, come in. Do the tour of the missions. It's it's a beautiful it's a beautiful city and with a lot of historical sites. So mm -hmm. yeah, definitely. I'll I'll add it to my list because I I had no idea it was in San Antonio. So <laughs> so it's yeah. good to know. Yeah. Um. And then also, you know, one of the things that I like to ask is, um, when did you realize? Okay, I'm I'm going to become a full time artist. Like. Usually, I know for some people it's childhood, but um, your path has been a little bit back and forth. So do you mind telling us a bit about that? <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, all my life, I uh, was just thinking about that the other day. And my youngest memories as a child are art related. So there was something there. I had the fortune of having an uncle who was an artist, um, Italian, uh, still an he is still with us, so he is an artist, I should say. And then I had friends of my mom, I remember going to, when we were living, I, I lived here in the States when I was young because my dad was pursuing his graduate work at UT. 
and uh, before going back to Monterrey. And she had a friend who in the basement of her house, she painted, remember that big eyes, those big eyes, you know, yeah. there was a movie recently. Okay, she did a lot of that. And I remember another great Colombian artist, uh, Fanny Sanin, who is a, one of the uh, foremost abstract artists in, in the abstract world of what, uh, she lives in New York, but she was very close to my, uh, my father. They were very good friends. And I remember her. So I have so many memories. I always wanted to be an artist and I always had this sense of doing something with my hands, creating. So if I wasn't doing a drawing or, you know, I was doing something with clay or something with, uh, uh, you know, just something, something manual. So I wanted to do art, but my dad was from Colombia, as you know, I you know you are too. He was from Cali and he was, uh, he met my mom. He came uh, with a full scholarship from the government of Colombia to study in El Tec de Monterrey. That's where I met my, my mom. That's why I was born in Monterrey, but he was very, very conservative, old fashioned. And, but he loved art. He loved impressionist art of all. And, um, and, uh, you know, I, I would tell my dad, I'd like to study art. And he would say, what is furthest from the truth? No, you've got some intellect. You're not doing that. You're not be a starving artist out there. So he would not encourage it. And I am from a traditional family, so I, I couldn't do it. So I guess trying to find my creative side, I, I decided the other only thing I wanted to do was plastic surgery. <laughs> so <laughs> so I, I went into a medical school, but at five years, I went in very young. Uh, because uh, I was able to do high school in a short amount of time. And so I went in very young and uh, five years, I, I really feel I had a burnout. I had a, a lot of responsibilities, not only of uh, being in medical school. So my husband was getting his PhD here in, uh, in also in Austin and let's get married. Okay, let's get married. And I thought, you know what? I'm done. I don't want to do this anymore. But even during medical school, I had a scholarship and part of having a scholarship, uh, you had to work for, you know, for whatever the instructor said. And I remember um, creating wax uh, uh, sculptures of uh, uh, embryology of the fetus as it, you know, the baby as it forms. So, you know, I was always there. I always wanted to go to uh, plastic surgeons, uh, you know, surgeries and that kind of thing. But I, I left it, and when I got married, and uh, we had our oldest son, Rafa, my husband was teaching at Texas Tech University in Lubbock, and uh, uh, I got pregnant, and, um, and uh, you know, we ended up in the hospital for some time with my oldest son, and I got to see medical school from, I mean, the medicine from, uh, from the other side, from the suffering. I just couldn't take it anymore. My husband said, you know what, why don't you do what you've always wanted to do and I will support you. And so that's been almost 40 years. <laughs> so, uh, so I've been doing it uh, full time, studying, taking workshops. And you know, uh, the, what I feel, you know, I tell, I tell a lot of my students, of course, you, you have to love to, to teach, but there's always somebody willing to learn something if you, uh, that you know. So if you start teaching, and I've been quoted saying this all, um, a lot, but I truly firmly believe it, that when one teaches, two learn. You know, you and I learn more than I taught. And so I started teaching uh, beginning uh, oil painting. And as I taught and I had to reinforce and really make try and make clear my thoughts, I was learning even more myself. And when you're dedicated to really helping your friends and you study and I would go to workshops and, and, uh, and here I am. And the more I paint, the more I realize I have so much more to, to, to learn. So it's an, you know, it's a never ending path, but it's a beautiful one. It's not an easy one, but it's a beautiful one. So I wouldn't change a thing. Yes. Yes. And it's very, uh, I think what's wonderful too about painting um you know as an as an act as a creative act and also teaching is that it really is you know this fountain that never ends you know it's something that 
like you said, it's a lifetime of learning. And I mean, even Michelangelo, when he was, I think he was in his 80s, he said, I'm still learning. Um, so it's it's a forever thing. I don't think painting is something that you can fully, and, and this is going to sound a little pessimistic, but you can't fully learn it in one lifetime. Um, but we're going to try. <laughs> we're going to try okay. anyway. I, no, I, I totally uh, uh, get what you're saying. And I totally believe that. I, I think that it's a lifelong journey. And uh, I guess if I were to say, oh, I've learned everything I know about art, wouldn't it be boring, you know? <laughs> and then there comes uh, something that's really, uh, you know, very important is like when you approach a blank canvas, <laughs> like I'm, a I'm going to start working on a mural size paintings, 10 feet by 10 feet, and they're, st and they're right here next to me because uh, I had to split them into two. I'm not sure if I'm going to put them horizontal or vertical. But anyways, and I'm like, oh boy, here we go. It's always intimidating, but you know, you have to just put one foot in front of the other and hopefully that everything will turn out at least yeah. a little bit as you imagined. <laughs> hopefully. Oh my gosh. Yeah. I think that's a, that's the, I think that's so common for us to have an image in our head and then it turns out a little bit different from what we imagine, but it still ends up quite beautiful. Um, and I like what you said about, you know, just putting one foot in front of the other, because I recently heard a very good analogy um, where, you know, if you're driving, say, from where you live all the way to, I don't know, New York City, all you need is the next hundred feet, right? You don't need to see beyond that. You don't have to see every single road right in front of you. You just have to know, OK, I just have to go this way and I will eventually reach New York. Um, and you know, that, that's how it yeah. is. It's like, uh, I heard somebody say, little by little is, is how one travels far. Exactly. I believe it, you know, I, I, you know I'm, I'm an example of that. And you know, I also have a lot of people that uh, will, especially women, I mentor when I'm able to, not, not only young people, you know, uh, all ages, but also men and women. But m women always tell me, but I have a family and I have children. How did you do it? And I say, listen, if I was able to do it, anybody can do it. Uh, it does. It's very important that you do have a supportive family. If you, you know, if you have a, uh, another half or whatever, you know, you have to have a very supportive uh, partner. Um, that understands and I have been very fortunate that my uh, my husband my children well my children were born with me having a studio all their lives and, uh, but but uh, it's important to have that support not only economically when you need it you know but all uh, you know uh, uh, what's the word spiritually I guess no you know what I'm trying to say uh, <laughs> Somebody that believes in, in, in truly in you and that is really there to go well, that little bit, a little bit more, a little bit more. And, but yeah. 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 I agree. That makes a huge difference. Um, because when you feel like the world is against you, it's very hard to, to be able to do anything. So it's good to have someone to, you know, hold your hand and be like, we've got this, you can do this. Um, yeah. yeah. And yeah. I, I do want to say that it's not about, uh, economically, you know, helping you because I, uh, you know, I did what I did is, you know, some people are fortunate to have, you know, the funds to be able to go pay, you know, buy all your materials, but we all know they're expensive when you're in oil paint. I think all the materials, but, uh, but that is the opportunity I mm -hmm. took of teaching so I could get the funds so I could go on mm -hmm. workshops so I could buy my materials and be able to continue this you know because uh i am fully aware that you know sometimes uh, it's not as easy to you know to go buy all your your uh, your materials well it might be easy for some people but not for everybody so i'm always thoughtful about that too yeah yeah and of course you know we all do what we can with what we have so that's a good place to start too um, and then, uh, to go back to your amazing paintings, you are going to be inducted into the Cowgirl, National Cowgirl Museum Hall of Fame. Uh, can you yeah. tell us about that? Boy, I am just so excited and beyond 
honored be beyond blessed i i can't even believe it i'm just uh, to be to be among these amazing trailblazers uh women that have uh, some have gone before us because some of them i think there's about 240 in the world and uh, some have already passed away i just can't wrap my head around it i have been here in my you know like i said painting what i love trying to you know, make these girls known, keeping my tradition alive without realizing that people were paying attention. You know, um, that's something that I always tell a lot of uh, students uh, or friends when we visit or say, well, it's just overwhelming. I keep looking at, you know, so-and-so is doing this and she's doing that and they had this and he's doing that. And I said, listen, I'm going to give you a, a piece of advice that I've taken very to heart and it is that I've done. I have only competed against myself. I, um, I, I study a lot of the old masters that are no longer here, but try not to get too involved in what, you know, so-and-so is doing because it can be intimidating. And the proof is to me, I, I've only been here in my studio, you know, teaching when I'm able, which I enjoy mentoring, studying, working, uh, trying to, trying to, you know, get a little bit better at this, at that, you know, and all of a sudden, you know, I, I receive these recognitions that people say, I get very emotional. I said, I do because I'm not expecting them. I am just honored to be in these great shows with so many amazing artists and you know to have somebody you know say hey you're doing something nice we like it it's just amazing so the national cowgirl of uh hall of fame uh if you ask me how did i how did they how did i get in their radar i don't know i want to find out i want to thank whoever was involved in into that but what i'm trying to say is that Hard work, you know, and just everyday work and work and uh, pays off. And finding your voice and it just pays off. I uh, I am beyond thrilled. I'm excited, not only because uh, it is the first time a Mexican-born uh, person, uh, woman, is uh, inducted into the Hall of Fame, which I did not know. I, uh, this um, a reporter. Uh, gave me that information and I was like, wow, you know, say, well, you're, you're breaking, uh, you know, you're, you're trailblazing. And I'm like, I, as I am speaking this to you, I am kind of like in awe, you know, because I just set out to paint the beauty that I see, that I enjoy, that I wanted to give. And, you know, and let me, uh, something that I recently heard that was worrisome to me was, uh, you know, there, I believe there's, I hope I'm not wrong, there's like 110 million people in Mexico. Charreria is the official sport of Mexico. When, uh, when somebody dresses as a charro or as caramusa, I would like to add, it is dressing as Mexico. So it's something very uh, done with very respect and symbolic in representing the culture, but Charreria, if there's 110 million people, I just heard, and I want to verify this, there's only 30,000 charros in the world. And I'm like, wow, I, so that's it. I need to even preserve more this, this uh, heritage because I hope it starts growing. I know that uh, it's been growing tremendously in, uh, in the States. And uh, what is admirable uh, that I have seen about the charreria, the difference between the charreria in Mexico and the charreria in the United States is that this is my, my very personal opinion, what I have witnessed, but you know, might not be everybody's, but a lot of the teams in Mexico, a lot of them have the biggest of endorsers of companies because you know they have the best of the best. I don't want to say everybody, but a lot of them, and a lot of the families that practice charreria here, they, 
what I've seen, what I've witnessed, they do it for the love of the sport. So they'll call me, they have, uh, you know, cookouts to get the funds, to get the new tack for the horses. For, we need new dresses. We need, uh, so it's, it just tells you how much they love this uh, sport that they are, you know, they work so hard and then they compete uh, at the uh, na uh, national level. They go through their different competitions and then the best of the, the United States goes to Mexico and competes with the best charros in Mexico. And, you know, and, and sometimes like when the girls are competing, I've heard they, they even have to borrow horses and I'm like, wow. You know, and they, so I'm just uh, trying to call attention to the amount of dedication and love they have to the sport, which is very, very admirable to me. Yeah. Um, you know, so um, learning this, if this is a fact, I want to find out by asking one of my historian friends, um, well, I feel more of a responsibility of letting, you know, really, really knowing who knows, in 200, 300 years, I hope there's even more. But, you know, at least know that what I painted was historically correct, because that is one thing, Laura, that I, I do. Like I said, uh, like Western artists pay very much attention to what the outfits are of whatever they're painting, that they go with the, uh, with the time they're painting or with the event. Well, I do that with the charreria. You don't just paint a man with what you think is a charro uh, hat and call him a charro. Uh, there is uh, rules and regulations that come every couple of years out of the Federación Mexicana de Charreria that tells you the outfit of the charro, there's several types of outfits. There is the gran gala, the gala, the faena, there's different outfits and they have to be worn this way. And these are the colors they can wear and this cannot be showing and the bow has to be this size. And if you are at an, at, in an event, uh, there can be there cannot be anybody in jeans in, in the rodeo. So I pay very careful attention. And the women too, the dresses have to be certain um, up to the neck. Uh, the outfit, they have to wear a bow with all their hair to the at the bottom of the, you know, the skull back here. And and uh, there can be no sequins in a uh, escaramuza dress, and there can be no shiny. So all of those rules, I'm paying attention because I want them to uh, be historically correct. And I basically, I want, and I hope that uh, the charros that see my paintings, uh, you know, feel that I did a good job about representing them. So yeah. So that is. Uh, Finding out that there was a group of such important group of women in the museum paying attention to what I was doing is just, I have no words. I have no words. They, uh, you know, I've, I've been reading who are in this, there, well, I, I should say there are several artists that are in this, in the Hall of Fame that I know that I'm, that I have always admired. And so I am, Beyond honor to be uh, accept the indu uh, be an inductee into the Hall of Fame. So, yeah, of course, and congratulations also. Um, Thank you. Of course, yeah. Um, and I think it's kind of it's very interesting how you describe the the charros and the scaramuzas in the in the United States to be you know they they're doing it for the love of the sport, uh, which is it's interesting because you're painting for the love of painting. So it's almost like a double layer of, of this, you know, attraction towards something that it, it's so important to both the riders and, and these sports people and to you as well. So it's it's very interesting to see that. Um, so I, I love that. And then also, speaking of Western art, um, you are painting Chinas Poblanas. Um, it got the Frederick Remington Award. At the Prida yes. West, which is so exciting. Yeah, um, I, have, I have a copy of it right here. It's a G Clay copy. <laughs> so, <laughs> yes, can you? But I, I'm telling you, I am yeah. just. Um, I can still remember that night. I could not believe it. I have. Uh, I I'm just telling you, Laura. I, I I'm not expecting it. I'm just, 
I, you know, I was I was invited to the Frida West uh, the year uh, last year, mm -hmm. and uh, I attended the gala there, and where they uh, they officially uh, introduced the artists. There was uh, four of us. Is it four of us? Yes, four of us. Uh, three uh, men and one woman, and uh, and I was fortunate to be invited, and I was just. Uh, Again, so many of my heroes are there, and I'm like, wow, I can't believe I'm here. So I was at the gala was a beautiful event, and I was just so, so honored to be there and just getting nervous about what I was going to paint for the next year. Yeah. And uh, so I decided to do what I, you know, again, what I'm doing. I'm introducing uh, my uh, uh, my culture, and uh, I thought about the China Poblanas. I had... I had uh, uh, just recently been in Puebla. That's where the China Poblana comes from, the outfit. And I had been in Puebla and, uh, of course, always with my Pushad box and my sketchbook and my camera. And I just happened to walk into this beautiful presentation of China's, China Poblana's uh, uh, dancing in a courtyard for... Uh, La Secretaría de Turismo, they, they were, and I just walked in and I said, oh my goodness, they were not only dancing this, they were dancing many, uh, you know, different dances. And, and I thought, again, I thought, okay, a lot of people in, uh, in the States know about the China Poblana, but they really don't know the history about the China Poblana and when we use it and what it was. So I said, I'm going to pay the China Poblanas. And I uh, added the chinacos in the back, which are the men that were the pre precursors of the uh, the charros. Many people, historians say that they were called chinacos because uh, chinas were the women and they would dress in these outfits, which I have a mannequin here of the contemporary version. But And so they would call the men chinacos because chinas and chinacos, that's where that was. <laughs> and they had a very um, different outfit uh, with a what they consider a precursor of the charro outfit. So again, trying to pick something that would be historically correct and that would open a dialogue. Okay, well, tell me about, you know, about this. And then I painted also what I love to represent my beautiful city of San Antonio. I painted the mission San Jose in the back and I painted um, uh, a girl from a team here, Jasmine um, which uh, Medina, which I, paint, I painted her since she was a baby. Uh, it's been really fun getting to know a lot of these artists, uh, a lot of these uh, escaramuzas and their families. Uh, so I painted her in front of the, another symbol of uh, San Antonio, the, the Mission San Jose, the queen of the missions. Uh, a lot of people don't realize that uh, many, uh, before these girls go out into a presentation or to a competition, this is a very highly, it has to be done by highly skilled uh, women athletes these are true athletes i invite anybody to go see what they do and you'll be it's like ballet on horses and and they are sitting side saddle which is very difficult at very very high high speeds as a mother if i was there i would be oh you know because you see things happen like you see at in rodeos that there are accidents and you you worry but so i decided to uh represent also a painting of a moment where before these girls go into the rodeo or in the rodeo many times, they'll say a prayer because they uh, they know that what they're about to uh, accomplish might be very dangerous. So I wanted to capture the moment. And they used to be, it used to be where teams would stop by the church going into the rodeo. Well, Mission San Jose here in San Antonio is in the southern part of the city. And it's very much also within uh, walking uh, distance from the oldest lienzo of uh, the U.S., where they have a lot of the events. So I said, okay, so this is what an escaramuza would do. They would ride, you know, and stop, of course, outside with their horse and say a little prayer and then pro uh, continue on to the, uh, to the event. So I captured, um, I try to capture that in Thankfully, they were very well received, and uh, mm -hmm. to my shock, I'll never forget it. You know, I I still remember what was happening that day. Oh my goodness! 
I don't think I've ever been so nervous. I'll tell you when uh, when I was uh, I was sitting there, um, and, and you know, as you have been in probably with many art shows, when there is an art show like this, well, you're just happy to that people like them, that they find a home. So I was just happy that my paintings found found a home, and I thought, oh my god, okay, I can kind of like breathe a sigh of relief because you want to make the people that invited, you want to make people happy, you want to, you know, so my two paintings I submitted to had found a home and I said, okay, so here we go to the wonderful dinner, it's a beautiful event, I'm going to enjoy the dinner, I can relax and, and watch all these people that are going to receive the award and just admire, you know, just being there, just being there, you know. And um, I was sitting next to a lovely couple, which I will not name, but as in that very, very wonderful couple. And she was saying to me, and I was, we were starting to bring out the food and the, uh, the event had started. And, and she says, well, have you, have you thought in, in case you uh, get an award, you know, what would you say? And I looked at her and said, are you kidding me? I mean, I can can win an award. I'm a rookie here. I'm just happy to be here. And she says, well, you know, and somebody would talk, says, and she would give a very constructive critique, you know, never telling me, oh, you won an award at all, you know. Mm -hmm. I don't even know if she knew, or maybe she did. I don't know. But she was hinting at it, and, I, and, and well, have you looked at the awards? And I said, yeah, there's no way. I'm a rookie here. I'm just happy, and I'm wanting to enjoy my dinner. And then uh, she was, well, that was a little bit long or, you know, a nice constructive critique or, and all of a sudden I thought, wait a minute, is there something going on here that I might not know? You know, I started thinking, I grabbed the brochure and, and I look at the awards and I said, oh, no way. Okay, I closed it and I said, I tried to eat. But by then my stomach is kind of, made, you know, a lot, like a big uh, knot, you know, I don't want to eat anymore. I'm like, and sure enough, then they announced this award and I see my painting on the on the screen. And it was like in slow motion. And I'm like, oh my goodness. And I'm like, I again I was not expecting it. So I still remember all those people that were there. And I'm walking very slowly to the podium. And I remember um Susan, the chairman of the board of the Prita was she wrote her she says to me there's like a little place where you can't see before you go on the stage you have to walk up and she says take off your name tag <laughs> and and I said I said I can't my hands were like this I mean I never shake it and my hands were like I said I can't do it and she said, okay I'll help you <laughs> she took it off and um and I got up there they took photos and then they asked me to talk and I just talked from the heart uh, you know, anybody that's seen the whole, you know, because I, I believe it stays there on forever because I've heard people tell me and thank me for whatever I said. I spoke from the heart. I was just in awe of being among such amazing colleagues, uh, artists that I've admired so much. Um, and I, uh, I felt in my heart that I had to thank somebody that in, in, in my time helped me a lot. And he's still helping so many wonderful artists. And he's a wonderful artist and giving and and I hope I didn't embarrass him but I did I just I did thank Dan Gerhardt um and uh and he is part of of course the Frida West and he has won this award and I, and I thanked him and thank my family and and the rest is a blur I don't even know what else I said you know but it is probably one of the most important moments in my life to this date uh, oh. and I, for one which I'm very grateful and I hope to be able to uh, submit more paintings that uh, doing what I'm doing, you know. But it's, yeah. it's just a shock. I can't. I can't tell you. I was in tears. I can I'm always, imagine. People say you're always in tears. I know because I'm not expecting it. It's just natural. I mean, if they tell me, I'm in awe. I, oh. I, I'm just. But yeah. Oh. 
that's so awesome that's i mean definitely unforgettable um and i think on your instagram you have a clip of of your speech too uh which i was watching and i it was i loved it i it seemed it really did seem like you really didn't expect it so i can totally understand now <laughs> oh and 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 to and to this day you know i uh I never know, know if this, uh, you know, this lovely couple next to me knew or not. Maybe she was trying to prepare me. I don't know. I don't know. She never said anything. And then it just got so busy afterwards, you know, visiting with people and I'm in shock and, mm -hmm. you know, but somebody, somebody was telling me uh, the other day, everything's happening so quickly for you. I said, and I thought, oh yeah. And then my husband says, wait a minute, not so quickly. You've been almost 40 years at it, you know? <laughs> <laughs> it's not that quickly it just seems that all of a sudden but it's been a uh, to this day it's been a beautiful ride and I wouldn't change anything about it anything you know that's so beautiful at Bold Brush we inspire artists to inspire the world because creating art creates magic and the world is currently in desperate need of magic Bold Brush provides artists with free art marketing, creativity, and business ideas and information. This show is an example. We also offer written resources, articles, and a free monthly art contest open to all visual artists. We believe that fortune favors the bold brush. And if you believe that too, sign up completely free at boldbrushshow.com. That's B-O-L-D-B-R-U-S-H show.com. The Bold Brush Show is sponsored by Basso. Now more than ever, it's crucial to have a website when you're an artist, especially if you want to be a professional in your career. Thankfully, with our special link, faso.com forward slash podcast, you can make that come true and also get over 50% off your first year on your artist website. Yes, that's basically the price of 12 lattes in one year, which I think is a really great deal considering that you get sleek and beautiful website templates that are also mobile friendly, e-commerce, print on demand in certain countries, as well as access to our marketing center that has our brand new art marketing calendar. And the art marketing calendar is something that you won't get with our competitor. The art marketing calendar gives you day-by-day, step-by-step guides on what you should be doing today, right now, in order to get your artwork out there and seen by the right eyes so that you can make more sales this year. So if you want to change your life and actually meet your sales goal this year, then start now by going to our special link, faso.com forward slash podcast. That's F-A-S-O dot com forward slash podcast. Well, congratulations again. Um, yeah, of course. And uh, I also like that, you know, you were you were very satisfied just with, you know, having your paintings in, in homes and loving homes, um, which, of course, uh, for any artist, it's like, oh, OK, my night is is made. It's like, I can only imagine, you know, that second sort of wave of, oh, Oh, there's, there's more. Okay. Wow. <laughs> that must have been insane. Um, but uh, what, I, what I'm also curious about, because you also just said, you know, you've been working your whole life um, towards, you know, I guess towards perfecting your craft and, you know, towards showing the beauty of your culture. Um, I wanted to know what it was like for you to transition, you know, from just painting at home and, you know, painting for yourself and learning to selling your first painting. What was that like for you? That's a really good question. I want to tell you, um, and I share this with a lot of people because it relates to many other professions, especially musicians, you know. But I started little by little. I started selling. When I was telling you, I was teaching. I was also selling paintings that I was doing that I don't even know, want to know where they're at, you know, because sometimes you wish it would d disappear. I don't even know where they're at, but at uh, secondhand furniture stores. That's how I started. My paintings would sell for $50, $100 at all. And I remember um, traveling to Mexico once and... Um, I, we would go all the time to visit the family, and uh, my son David, who was a grown, you know, a man now with his own family, young ba uh, children, uh, he was like four or five years old, and we were walking down the um, the main aisle when when the airports were all open, you know, where there was no, you know, you can't go past, you know, back then, 
probably you were probably his age. <laughs> so, but but anyways, uh, uh, there was a local gallery that used to display paintings on the main on the main uh, corridor as you were going into the gate. And my my son pulls at me, says, "Mom, mom, there's your painting." And I'm like, what? And I turn around and I look at my painting. I said, why is my painting here? I sold it at the second hand furniture store for, you know, whatever. And this one was uh, like, I think $500. I, was, I had jumped like from there to, you know, I, I remember it was at least double or something. And I was about to leave and I said, when I come back, I'm going to call and see what this is about. And as, as soon as I got back, uh, the owner, she says to me, uh, she says, well, we've been selling your paintings um, very often. I thought it was you that was bringing it. And I said, no, it's not me. But so I remember because I was selling for a hundred dollars that I made a jump to 500, you know, or something like that. But it was big for me way back. It was big. But I have been very careful to sell my paintings and be a uh, Little by little, raising my prices, raising my price, never coming back down. Because I wanted, you know, you think about collectors and you say, well, if they are willing to buy one of my paintings and pay whatever amount, you know, you don't want to know that, oh, well, you know, unfortunately, some artists will say, well, if you buy it at my studio, it'll cost you less or than if you buy it so-and-so which is so wrong, you know, so wrong in so many levels. Um, so I have been very, very careful through the years that as I moved from little galleries to finally another gallery to another, uh, that whatever you buy at the gallery for whatever it is, you're going to buy it in my studio for whatever, it, the same amount. I've never, so I've been very careful, which has helped me, I guess, because galleries also get burned about, People, because now with social media, any person interested uh, in your work, well, they go Google you and then they can find you. What I do, I usually do is I ask people, where did if they, if that happens to me, somebody caught, where did you hear from me? Of course, you never know if they're going to tell you the truth or not. They could say, well, I went to this gallery and I heard about you and I Googled you. But what I've done is when they mention a gallery or another one, I always call the gallery and I tell them, listen, I don't know if you know this person, but this person has contacted me. And if I do sell, you know, I, you know, I'll, you will get your. But anyways, so what I've been is I've been very, very, very careful. And when I started selling, it was hard to let go some of the paintings. It really was. Now I find it as an honor that anybody would consider, you know, uh, to add their painting to their collection. But I have been very careful. I have been rejected many times, and that is fine. I just recently, because I still have my old studio in my house before I built this studio, there's still a lot of stuff I haven't moved over. And I came across a, I came across a uh, letter from a gallery which I had submitted my work, and uh, and the gallery wrote me a letter, a very nice letter that said, you know, we just don't feel we are a fit for you now. And, and that was, you know, I took, it was very hard because, you know, you're an artist. We put our hearts in our sleeves. Thankfully, we're not like performers, at least, you know, I, that we have to sing there in live. At least we can paint, then go take it over and then take rejection kind of, you know, in private or what. But it's a very, it's very sensitive. But I found this letter and I found a letter of that same gallery inviting me. Okay. Now, I was so happy that I felt, I must say, with years uh, difference, said, you know, the gallery was right. I wasn't probably ready for that. Or maybe they didn't believe. Uh, I don't know, you know. But the thing is that it's hard to take rejection. But I, you know, I have taken, re I have had shows where, and I did not sell one piece of, of, of a painting. So we have to learn that, uh, at least in my life, it's not all been wonderful, wonderful, wonderful. I, you know, it's uh, it's learning. It's um, trying to be strong and to make not take it personally that, well, 
okay, they didn't like my work. Uh, well, it's not because not you're not good. Like another friend artist says to me, when you have a show and a painting doesn't sell well, it's just that the right collector hasn't come uh, across. And it's true, it's true, uh, it's happened to me. Might I find a home, I send it somewhere, else, it'll find a home. So, so uh, it was very rewarding moving into selling my paintings. I was able to afford, you know, buying my own, uh, you know, cause you know, to, this this uh, this uh, business takes a lot of investment. These paintings that are back here, actually, most of these are G-click copies. Some are our originals, but it's few. Um, and there's more over there. And the only reason I have those here, they don't have the beautiful frames that I usually, uh, I have very simple frames, but we know that frames are expensive and all of that. So it's, you have to put money to make more, but, it's been very rewarding. Sometimes it's been hard. It hasn't been easy. I still remember going, somebody told me once, how did you get into the Santa Fe market? You know, which was a very hard market to get into it. It was many years ago. And back then, um, I remember doing this and uh, I made CDs. There was in social media or here's my website. It was just really just started. I made these CDs with music and it had like a, a show of my paintings. And at the end it would stop and say, looking for representation and, and my name and, you know, my phone number. And then I put them in one of those old, you know, covers. And I literally went through all Canyon Road and, dro and dropped them off. And one gallery called me and that put my foot on Canyon Road and, uh, I will still remember, I, I will still remember that, but it, it was, it's a hard, you know, it, it's not an easy road, but it is a rewarding, uh, you know, road. And uh, these are the kind of things I, uh, a lot of people come and ask me about and, and I try to be as honest and help them and why not, you know, if people have been so gracious to share with me the way they did it or be it technically or, you know, some experience about this business of being an artist. And I, uh, I'm, I'm very happy when I have time to be able to talk to them and give me, give them my advice. And now I must say that uh, I've been very fortunate that I have never uh, submitted to a show. I have always been invited for which I'm very grateful. I have been invited to so many other art shows, which I wish I could say yes. And you know, you work so hard. Oh, you're, oh, I would like to be in this show. This would be amazing. And then it comes to a point where, yeah, you are invited, but can you do it? Can you really paint that many paintings in such, you know? And it has been very hard to, to call people or write them and say, I'm sorry, I can't do it as much as I want. And you hope that you're not burning bridges, but it's the honest truth, just like, galleries I, i'm waiting for you to present something new but i don't know if i'm getting slower as i'm getting older in age or what it is or i made more complex paintings but i don't paint that quick i paint every day long a uh, long day 10 12 hours not 10 no maybe up to 10 hours uh when but uh but I don't paint that quick, so it's hard to say no, but you have to, otherwise you're sacrificing, in my point, in my, in my experience, you're sacrificing quality. And I just recently had to ask one of these major shows if I could sit out for uh, this year because I have so many commissions that I have, uh, that have been requested from me and uh, I said, yes, and I, I need to deliver these. So they were very uh, nice and they said, yeah, that I hope just you don't just not show up anymore. I said, no, I just really need one year. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, <clears throat> it's, and, but getting back to the, get like the business thing, I always tell my students, be very careful that if you are going to go up on your prices, that you be very careful and you do not come back because mm -hmm. collector's world is very small. Galleries world is very small and uh, you have to be very, professional about this so that people have credibility in your work, you know? And uh, so I have been that way and um, 
and I couldn't be happier to where I'm at right now, you know? So. Yeah. Yeah. And you, you make an interesting point too, where, um, and I think I read this in, in a book, uh, that's actually, it talks about the marketing and the business side of painting and how, uh, very few artists, realize that you know when when you're in the early days of your career it's really really nice to be anonymous to an extent because you have so much freedom and time compared to later on when your work gets more more popular suddenly you know things like this happen where like, like how you mentioned that you have to pick like I, I can do this show but I can't do that show or yes. I have so many commissions and, and it turns out, you know, your your time is now monopolized in a very different way. So there are, you know, pros and cons, of course, um, that, you know, it, it's it's interesting to, and, and, to transition that way. Yes. And if I might add to, uh, in my case, I feel a great uh, responsibility in continuing to work with those galleries that believed in you and probably nobody believed in you, you know? So I, I try as much as I can. I, um, and I haven't been as, as good as I wish I was for the same reason. I just all of a sudden got overwhelmed with work, but you know, galleries, oh, some people complain, well, they're charging a lot or they're, you know, whatever, or museums, but they do so much for you too. You know, we can't, they, they put your name out there. They present you. So mm -hmm. I believe in always, uh, you know, uh, oh, that's always in my, in my, especially also, also with collectors. I have uh, collectors that been collecting me when I was barely starting. Um, and when they approach you and they say, will you do this commission for me? And say, no, you know? Yeah. Um, you know, that's that's how I see it. And um, I have been very fortunate that I was able uh, to build a studio. And uh, I'm here with uh, some people know all the nightmare I went through building the studio, which uh, I don't want to go there. But just research who you hire to build a studio before you do or a house or whatever. Uh, but I'm grateful this place is uh, has beautiful light, is large and uh, I know how hard it can be to have a, I remember my breakfast and up being my studio and pulling all your art supplies out to the kitchen, you know, when you want to work and then pulling them all back, you know, it's hard. So I, I never give up for granted any of this. And I also, like somebody was telling me the other day, well, what are you going to do with all those awards you, you've won through the years? And I said, listen, uh, you're only as good as your last painting. I don't, take anything for granted. I'm very honored and I have some out there because people want to come see them or they can come see, you know, if they want to see them. But uh, just if, if anything, these awards inspire you to work even harder. You know, Absolutely. that's what, yes. I, what I, I feel. So yeah, the business side of it uh, is, is, it's something that you have to consider, you know, that I, I wish a, a more people knew about it. Uh, it's, it's also like uh, advertising to me has been very important in my work. Getting yeah. my name, I didn't know, you know, that it was working. And I got that advice from a, a, a dear friend of mine, one amazing artist, Camille Przewodnik, many years ago. She said, you know, advertising is a lot. And uh, I started putting little ads, you know, little ads. I, I even put ads, I remember back then where I would paint a painting that I was very proud of. And I said, seeking representation, you know, that kind of thing. And uh, yeah, I did get that. But slowly I've been, um, uh, you know, it hasn't been, again, it hasn't been quick. It's been a long road. But like I tell my students and friends, you know, when we when we talk about these things and, and they said, oh, well, thank you for sharing. I said, well, why reinvent the wheel when there's somebody that can tell you their point of view? Uh, one thing is that when I when I visit with somebody and I give them my point or even if I'm critiquing a, a painting or anything, I said, first of all, I said, I will critique this painting, but I want to make sure that, you know, this is only my point of view. And if I tell you, listen, this is wrong, or you got to work on this or whatever, 
and you decide not to do it, that's perfectly fine. You're not hurting my feelings and I'm getting upset or whatever. Uh, you know, it's only my point of view. And I am sharing, with, again, with the business part, I'm sharing with you what I've gone through, what's worked for me, what maybe not worked with me, for me. And, uh, you know, I don't consider I'm all that in a bag of chips, like the kids say, you know, but I'm just sharing what's worked for me. And if you want to, you know, know, I'll be happy to share. Yeah. No, and I, I love that. And that's also why we have this podcast, because, you know, it's uh, the, I guess, the business and marketing side of, of being an artist, you know, it is extremely important. It's as important as having really good work. Um, and I love hearing also the different paths that people have taken, because I've interviewed artists who, like you, tried and true gallery model, it works for them, uh, sell prints on their website, works perfectly. Um, and then other people who sell through their website only, no gallery at all. I mean, there's yeah. really no rule to to yeah. how it works. It's just a matter of what are you comfortable with? Of course, for some people, it might be really difficult to work with a gallery, or maybe they live in a place that's not close to galleries um, that they would want to be with in person. Um, so the online model works for them or, you know, or people who like you, they prefer the gallery model because honestly, I agree. Uh, it's more comfortable. They handle all the advertising. They handle collectors. They handle the shipping, which honestly, I have shipped quite a few paintings and it can be such a hassle. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Sometimes yeah. you wish you could ride with your paintings to somewhere it's going, you know, it's, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, it, so, it, helps. It, it does help also to find a great gallery that you, that you feel comfortable and that is close to you that you can drive to. <laughs> you yes. Know? Yeah, which it's, I, I, I'm very fortunate to have inside gallery, one of the best galleries that, you know, so very yeah. close to. But yeah, it's, it's, there's a lot to that. A lot, a lot to that. And um, mm -hmm. yeah, um, we can. Well, I'm actually curious to know, like what, uh, what for you has been the most lucrative, you know, way that you've, been able to sell your work has it just been the gallery model has it also been maybe social media and like maybe ads because I mean what worked maybe like in the 90s and early 2000s has completely revolutionized <laughs> because of the internet and social media um what has been you know the thing that has worked the most for you when it comes to selling your work <clears throat> I think it's been uh the galleries have had a very important part in my in my professional life i for sure. I mean, for them to have been, been invited me for the first time, uh, I still remember who that was, and, and I'm very, very grateful to that. But to me, all has worked. You know, I do a lot of ads. You know, it is expensive, but I, I trust that it's going to work out. And thankfully, up to today, I, it, it has worked. And uh, now it's about keeping the deadlines because I, I will put contracts with the magazines for so many ads. And when you're working on commissions and you don't have that much work around, you know, you can't put your commission on in an ad. So uh, that's, a, uh, that's a little bit hard, but I'll tell you something that's really interesting. Uh, almost everybody that knows me knows, and knows that, believe it or not, I am an introvert <laughs> with an extrovert profession. Uh, I'm fine with small groups, but I'm not like a social butterfly, you know, uh, so, uh, but I am very open about who I am and almost everybody knows, you know, that what you, when you talk to me, you ask me, you know, I'll tell you whatever. So I have my social media totally open. Um, <clears throat> now I did pay, I have paid a price for that through the years because I have a couple of horrors, you know, kind of horror, uh, stories through the years when I was younger, so younger, younger about, you know, picking up unwanted, unsolicited, uh, attention, that kind of thing, which is a whole story by itself and, you know, men and women and whatever, but having my social media and having a social media out there and a professional website. And here's a plug because I really believe in uh, in uh, Fine Art Studio Online, the best, the very best, the easiest to manage, the easiest to upload. And not only that, but what you get back from it, uh, you know, all the 
all how they uh, they'll post about you in so many different platforms and the network of people that follow them. So there, I truly believe in, and I tell all my students, all my friends that ask them, don't go, just go through. Uh, I wish they would even branch out to different professions. Like y'all do it such a great, great job. But going back to social uh, social media, um, I've had my, uh, my, uh, uh, my workout, um, I first had a, uh, an account with my personal name, you know, and uh, I had to close up some of my private family because for the same reason, um, I have three children, I have grandchildren, and you have all these people that follow you. And then you, I reached that 5,000 limit, you know, of people that can follow you. So then I opened a new one, The Art Of, and uh, people really always request to join my per, uh, my private, but, you know, they only know it's it's open. You don't need to join, but, but you know, um, I try and add as, you know, it can come down a little bit or not. But what I'm trying to say is the social media is so important. And I know there's a lot of people who say, well, I'm very private. Uh, and I understand that. But there, I guess there's a way you can do that. And then, well, they're going to clone my paintings. Yeah, they do that also. They'll, you know, unfortunately, some countries don't believe in copyrights. And, you know, they'll, they'll copy. They'll do all kinds of stuff with your work. Yes, I know that. But if you only knew the amount of um <clears throat> paintings or, or collectors that I will ask um by the way how did you hear about my work you know or how did you come across it if I, if I can ask that question because many times and with a good reason you know a gallery or a museum will sell a painting and uh, unless you go and ask for it you know it's I guess I find it it's like a uh, unwritten etiquette you know uh thing about I don't ask who has it. Maybe I'm wrong. I don't know, but I don't. Unless somebody is offering up that information or the collector, hey, I owe this painting. But if you only know how many people will tell me, well, I've been so I've been following you on social media for so many years, and then you find out their name. Let's say you and you look for them, and it's not always the case, but many times, and you look for them, and you realize. Uh, they might not officially follow you. They might not interact. Or like all of these things that, you know, that I've been surprised with. They've been following me. I had no, if I had my social media close, they probably would have not found me, you know? Mm -hmm. So I believe very much on my website, professionally presented. Newsletter. I don't. I don't write that many newsletters, but it's very important to keep your your uh, your collectors, your admirers, your students, or whoever um, open. And it's uh, wonderful because it's worldwide. So I have followers from all over the world. Um, and uh, and then I also do my uh, my ads. I do ads in magazines, but I also do social media ads. I do with Volbrush ads. I do with. Uh, Instagram, I run a campaign. So I believe that uh, it's important to get your work out there and uh, having to learn platforms like I, I, you know, I joined Twitter. Why? Because I, I had joined Instagram a long time ago and I just kept it, you know, just back there. Like I wouldn't really interact. And then in Instagram became really like the platform to put a lot of, uh, you know, the work out. Uh, so when this, oh, it's not Twitter. I'm sorry, not Twitter. It's, uh, what's the, this new one? TikTok? Gosh, I can't. No, not TikTok. I do, I have, I have signed up on TikTok, but I think I only have like a little reel or, no. Um, it's the other one. What's it called? Uh, threads, Threads. Threads, yes. So I, I, I jumped on Threads just because I thought, I lost a lot of time with Instagram, so I need to get on onto Threads. And I haven't really truly figured it out, but I do keep posting things mm -hmm. because I feel you need, you need to have your name out there. You know, you need to know, uh, especially for somebody like me, like I've, I've been um, recently having uh, some uh, newspaper interviews uh, locally and that kind of thing. And I've been here for over 35 years in this beautiful city. I'm not a social butterfly. You know, I, I work every day. I don't know if this happens to you, but it happens to me. Uh, that uh, this kind of art 
really is exhausting. I get home, or maybe because I'm getting older, I don't know. I get home and, oh, let's go out. And I'm like, no, I just want to rest. And I've been painting all day. And some people will say to you, I bet they, they've told you this, but, oh, you must live an, an amazing life, uh, you know, with uh, just painting and, you know, and uh, if you only knew how, how hard, uh, what a, a hard job this is. And I can um, tell you an example. I uh, I have a, a wonderful artist uh, uh, student uh, that I mentor, and he's a retired physician. He was an anesthesiologist and, uh, <clears throat> here in San Antonio. And, you know, working long days, and he retired. And now he retired. He uh, has a little ranch that he that is very close to his home, and he is always doing physical things. He's a very creative uh, man and uh, building things and moving things. And he's also, a, you know, uh, does all kinds of creative things. And he says to me, you know, Gladys, I come here when I used to teach. He says, I come here on Tuesdays. We paint here from 9 to 5 because that's what I, I had a group here from 9 to 5. I get home. Oh, well, wait a minute. She, uh, I'm sorry. He says, I go and I work at the, at, at, the, at the ranch and I do all this physical labor. I get home and my wife says, let's go watch a movie. Let's go do this. And I have all the energy in the world. But when I go back from being at your studio from nine to five, working on a still life or whatever, I'm exhausted. And I said, Sergio, I'm just so happy you just said that because you realize it. It's not, you know, it's, it's very exhausting. The concentration the drawing the you know that yeah. we're, we're under so i'm not a social butterfly so a lot of people don't know that i live here in san antonio i think people know me more from outside of san antonio than here because um i don't go out that much i am very much in my studio and the mm -hmm. extra time i have is with the, my uh, wonderful grandchildren that i now have or my my family my husband church yeah important in my life so um having a social uh, great social media uh presence um is very important so absolutely absolutely I'm and i i love that your students said that it's exhausting because it truly truly is um it really takes it out of you i mean when i finished studying at, at the two ateliers that i was at i realized that i had been burned out for years um, because it's so heavy. I mean, being at, you know, in front of a painting for 12 hours a day, because yeah. that's, you know, at an atelier, you do that also, um, especially when you're yes. learning. God, yes. You, you really just have no energy for anything else. So I totally understand that. And it is very, very convenient that, you know, before, you know, you had to go out physically to meet people and to go to these galleries and to, you know, talk to them, talk to potential collectors. Today, it's, it's very great that we just have the internet um, to connect with these people because whew, if not, yeah. <laughs> God, yeah. I would never show my face out there. I would, I would definitely be a starving artist. Um. <laughs> I, you know, I was thinking yesterday, I was visiting with somebody and I was telling them uh, the same, you know, about when I started. And uh, when I used to teach, and this is what I would do, and I can't believe I'm going to tell you what I, I used to do, and I would not even think about doing it right now. But I used to teach at the Copini Academy from 8.30 to 11.30, one class. Then I would have a half an hour for lunch. Then I would teach from 12 to 3. Then I would teach from 3 to 6. And then from 6 to 6.30 to 9.30, I would, I would attend life drawing. And I think about it, I said, uh, I must have been so much younger because <laughs> I, oh I went out. but it was the same thing. It was about uh, uh, teaching, sharing what I knew, and in the, in the process, learning myself, being able to get the funds, to be able to afford, and then to, at the very end, to go to life drawing, uh, you know, and have the wonderful models. Uh, so, so I used to, I say that, and I thought, I don't know. It's, it's just like I remember my first show at uh, in another gallery on, in Santa Fe, because the the first gallery that I had ever joined, he moved to Florida. Then I another gallery uh, invited me, and then that gallery went modern. So then I went into another gallery, and uh, I remember she she called me, 
And she said, I just heard that the so-and-so gallery that you are into, I, I know your work because I go visit the gallery. And, um, and that gallery decided to go into um, modern contemporary art. And so I, I was no longer a fit there. They, you know, they let us representational artists uh, go. And, and she said, I would like to invite you to my, um, to my gallery. Um, I, ha I had scheduled a two person show, but if you can get me 12 paintings together in eight weeks or six weeks, something very short, um, I would like for you to have the show. And I can't believe I said yes, and I did it. Oh my God. <laughs> and I did it. I can't believe I did that. I know I think about that and I'm like, wow, it must have been much quicker then. Um, but I did it. Um, I remember that a wonderful lady that uh, invited me. And uh, I do remember being a little bit disappointed because when I got to the opening of the show, what I consider were my strongest paintings, gratefully. Uh, some of them had sold and uh, the buyers had taken the paintings with them. So for the opening, there was my bit, you know, what I thought was my stronger work was not there. But but then again, I was happy to be in the gallery. And uh, yeah, I've got, you know, I've got a lot of stories. I can tell you, like, oh. I know a lot of people relate to that. But mm -hmm. Wow. Yeah. 12 paintings in, in six yeah. weeks. And I painted till midnight every oh. night. In I had a barn, a, a structure in the backyard, and I oh. painted. But I did That's it. A grind. That's a major grind right there, especially if they were like, even if they were small paintings, that's still. They were. Yeah, they were, yeah, they were. They were small, but uh, I mean, smaller. I had a couple of them, but. Um, mm -hmm. But now I, you know, if I do a big painting, that's because I do. Uh, drawings I do sketches I do color studies I do different washes as to what the effect is going to be and um, you know it's um and again the reason I, I I've got these copies here I will tell you is that I had a uh, <clears throat> uh, I had the um a, a wonderful group of board members of a major museum come into they schedule a, a a visit here to the studio it will be one of my most memorable visits I have ever had in the studio here. Um, but uh, I felt kind of awkward because, of course, I said, yes, I'd be delighted for you all to come to the studio. But I was worried because my paintings were all, you know, most of them were gone. And um, and so I called my uh, my photographer and I asked them to do G clay copies of uh some of my paintings so I could hang them in these simple frames. So I bought these simple frames. And so that, cause you know, I, I would say, well, people come into the studio and sometimes there's paintings and sometimes there's not that many. And they'll say, well, what do you do? And what do I do? Show them photos or what? Show them, yeah. you know? So, uh, so I said, let's just do that and, and, and hang them. And that's the reason they are here, but uh, you mm -hmm. know, that's only the reason, and then I'm comm commemorating my induction into the uh, Cowgirl National Hall of Fame. I did release some some G class, mm. but uh, boy, those are a lot of those are a lot of work. Oh, that's a yes. lot. Of work. I I decided yeah. that I I put a stop to that. I said no. I don't think I I want to continue doing these it's a lot of work you and I'm a one woman uh what's it called uh I do everything I, I have nobody that helps me you know so I do my craving my framing my social media everything it's only me uh, I don't have an assistant I tried having an assistant it did not work I just can't have somebody behind me you know I just can't do it yeah so but, yeah, that's understandable Oh man, and it's it's a very good idea to have those copies though in your studio because you know, like it, like how you mentioned, you know, if someone does come and uh, you know your studio is empty, it, it kind of feels a little bit funny. Um, so it's it's yeah. a smart thing to to have that because then you know have a visitor and they're like, oh my god, this painting, I love it. Um, it might draw their attention to maybe buying a print of it or even another painting. Yeah. It's good. It's like a yeah. physical portfolio. You know, it's it's funny, but. Um... That one right there. Can you see that one? I I, I called it untitled. This mm -hmm. I submitted to the Briscoe uh, Night of Artist Show, and uh, 
very, you know, it, it, it won a, an award. And um, <clears throat> this one in, in particular um, was one of the first one that I told my photographer to do a copy. <laughs> so I had it hanging in a frame and uh, somebody came in, please, 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 can I have it? Can I have it? Please. I said, I don't sell copies. They're only for, please. And so he, I said, okay, you can have it. And then I had my photographer do another one. And then again, and then again, it was like four times it found a home. And I said, oh boy, okay, well, but I, I, I'm not, I, uh, I have run some limited edition prints. I, and I'm not doing it anymore. It's just, um, it's really, really time consuming. I can understand that. I mean, getting the prints to, to look good and, and it, it could be a, it could be a hassle. I know some people do really well, you know, selling limited edition prints, um, but it definitely does take a lot of work. Um, and also, really you know, there's the, the whole thing of like, oh, like you can have them made at a specific place and then they ship it out. But some people want you to sign the painting like physically. So it's, it's a lot of, uh, there's a lot of little things to take care of when you're doing jiclace um, and prints. And then, and then I must say something, uh, Laura, that you must know. Then, then there's the people that uh, that uh, illegally copy your paintings and sell them. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's like I have had so much of that, and I uh, sometimes I had just gotten back from Europe, and I was, I guess, I was still very tired, and and here again. Etsy and Amazon, and they caught me in a bad. Sometimes I'll throw a little bit of a rant on my social media, and you know, mm -hmm. I was upset about it. But you can't really control them. I even had this guy, this person in Asia, do a tattoo, which is oh, funny. Isn't it funny? A, tat a tattoo, an Asian person. I don't know who, but and it, it turns out that the model for that precise painting my daughter used to model a lot for me and my daughter says it's kind of weird to know that somebody's got a tattoo yeah. <laughs> you know but you can't control that i mean i did get upset this last time specifically because it was on these major platforms like etsy and amazon you would think mm -hmm. right and especially yeah. because i had already reported them and they, they get away with it. So there's no way yeah. to make them stop. So what I'm gonna try, I was gonna to try to say this this business of the uh, limited edition print, uh, it's a, a way to reach a lot of other uh, collectors that cannot afford your, your, you know, your original. And I understand that. And I thought it would be very easy. So I had this painting right here reproduced on a website. Um, that some of uh, my friend artists use and they just upload their images and that company is an open you know edition they'll print and they'll do that kind of thing and i i wasn't very enthused about the color that they matched over there and so i thought it's so much work uh, i really don't have the time uh, i rather just paint one painting by painting so uh you know, I sold enough and I'm going to close the edition as to where it is. I said, I think I'm going to, I said, I'm going to close it in November. Uh, mm. Yeah, November. Uh, so that's it. You yeah. know? Yeah. You know, again, you know, everyone's path is different and, and it's perfectly mm -hmm. fine. It's, you know, you're definitely, you know, wanting to put all of your energy into other endeavors, painting. Yeah. And that's exactly. perfectly fine. That's perfectly yeah. fine. Um, and I love that. And also I have a very interesting question, um, that, you know, I've been asking some of my guests and that is, do you have any hobbies that you do outside of painting? No, my hobby is all my love is art. Uh, other than, uh, than, uh, yard work, you know, I love to have a, a nice looking yard, but no, I did that. I knitted, I tatted, I crocheted, I, I sewed a lot of clothes. Uh, when I was younger, um, I'm going to tell you, um, I, I would like to pick up not as a hobby sculpting, but I don't know if I have enough years in my life to become a really good, you know, a good one. Uh, mm -hmm. But I've been tempted to sign up for a, for a sculpting class. It really, you know, uh, calls me, but then I have all this work that I have to, uh, that I have committed uh, to uh, producing uh, because yeah, 
that's one thing that I think a lot of, a lot of us artists, male and female, the same. You know, we we feel is it's hard to take a vacation. Although, again, I always take my pushout box. <laughs> but even if I've taken my pushout box, we we just recently uh, did a river cruise in Europe. My husband and I, and it was wonderful because I took my pushout box and. Uh, I tried these new water-soluble oils that, that I hadn't tried those in many, many years when they first came out. And I was really pleasantly surprised because I didn't have to go look for any uh, uh, mineral sp spirits or gas or anything. Uh, it was, and it was wonderful to paint in my cabin and not have the smell of, of that. I really enjoyed doing that. Um, but it's hard to uh, take it. For me, and I know, and I know, I've, like I said, I've, I've shared this with many artists to not feel guilty that you're not in the studio, that you're not working on this and that. I know that a lot of us share that, but then again, it shouldn't be that way because at the end, it is also our life. We have to, you know. Yeah. And being a woman, being a grandmother now, um, it, it has been hard. Um, I have uh, visited with several artist friends that are grand uh, grandmothers, some a little bit older than me or some my age. And, you know, you sometimes you might have uh, dreamt. In my case, I had a wonderful grandmother that I love dearly, but I, I can't be what she was. I am too busy. And uh, I was telling a friend of mine, how do you deal with that? That you're not, you know, doing what others, you're not retired. You're not, I don't think I'll ever retire, you know. But, you're not doing what the grandmothers usually do and she said to me something very wisely and she said you know uh, Gladys she said I've come to terms with that a long time ago uh, that my children will not have a Grammy or a granny or a yatita or a abue whatever that they uh, that you see you know stereotypical baking cookies and knitting <laughs> sweaters or whatever but they will have a, a, a grandmother that painted beautiful paintings that sometimes they'll remember her for her paintings. So there, so that made me feel better. So now yeah. if I don't cook when I have visit and I order out, that's okay. I'll still put a nice table uh, setting because I love to do that. <laughs> so, Absolutely. <laughs> but, yeah. No, um, yeah, that's it's so far interesting. Brilliant. Yeah. And by the yeah. way, I want to say that uh, I was a board member of the American Women Artists. Mm -hmm. And uh, I want to invite uh, everybody to look over that organization. It's an amazing organization. They're doing a great job of really promoting women's art. I was not aware um, uh, when I started. I was not aware. I really wasn't. I mean, I go to uh, museums, but I did. I was not aware that many of these great uh, museums, uh, five to six or seven percent of the artwork is done by women and this uh, amazing uh, organization is doing an amazing job of trying to get more art uh, women artists uh, into these great collections and I had to step down unfortunately from their board because it is one of those amazing board where they are very hard work uh, workers and I had never encountered a board that that was such a uh, committed like that and uh, that in rightfully deserves a lot of time and uh, I just could not give it to to them what they deserved and I had to step down and it was hard to do that but I just could not do it and um, I also have other responsibilities that my friends that are close to me know about, but it was just too hard. So um, I want to invite everybody uh, to check out the American Women Artists. It's a great organization to be a, a member at and to participate in their shows. So I got to put a plug in for them. I don't know why I remembered to talk about that, <laughs> but, you know. That's excellent. Yeah, especially, you know. Uh, for for female artists who are just starting out or who want to maybe join, uh, I guess, a cause that means something to them. It's, it's an excellent thing to uh, promote. Um, and then for my final question, um, do you have any upcoming shows or exhibitions or anything that you would like to promote? Uh, <clears throat> for the next two years, I'm pretty booked up with what I've committed as to museum shows. So I have... Uh, uh, 
had to request to sit out at the Quest for the West of the Idol Joy Museum of uh, American and Western Art in Indianapolis. I was sad, but I just didn't do it. Um, I have to finish murals. I have to do several uh, official portraits. I am doing official portraits of historians of Charreria in Mexico also. And then I am uh, participating in the Prix du West again, and I'm participating in the Briscoe Night of Artists. <clears throat> I had to decline the um, another, well, several other Western art shows, but that's about all I can do. Um, you know, I, I wish I could, I wish I could say more. I have been offered uh, one woman shows here and in Mexico and I, uh, I don't know if I'll ever have one in Mexico. I would love to have one in Mexico, but I don't think I could get all that work uh, and, and transport it to Mexico without, there's a whole deal with taxes and all of that. But anyways, yeah. maybe someday, and uh, maybe someday I would like to have another one woman show. I've, I've been offered several, but to this day, I haven't scheduled anything. Um, my, uh, my, you know, I'm pretty booked up to 2025 right now. Wow. That's awesome, to the, though. To the end of 2025, yes, I have. Uh, I have been. Um, <clears throat> I have been commissioned by the Daughters of the American Revolution to paint the official portrait of their uh, President General for Washington D.C. So I'll be doing that, and I have also been have been uh, notified that I'm receiving an award of the Tech uh, Women, and I don't want to quote this wrong because you might have to it's the texas women in the art award in uh, in austin and in march also so i'm very grateful for that and um and just working hard continue doing what i do that's you know that's all yeah wow that's oh all. my gosh you're a busy woman <laughs> yeah. yes i am so and again i you know it just happened all of a sudden all of a sudden, 40 years later, all of a sudden. Yeah. <laughs> I, say, I say that, you know, sarcastically, 40 years now, I'm just very grateful for everything. And it still feels like I just started. It really does. Mm. You know, when I, yeah. when I sit with somebody like you and I'm talking about all of this, I said, wow, is that 20 years? Was that 30 years? Is that almost 40 years? Oh, my goodness. <laughs> you know? Yeah. Yeah. It's a uh, time flies, I guess, especially when you're having fun and painting. <laughs> time flies. Yes, it does. And uh, yeah. in case anybody's wondering uh, what I have behind me, I want to show you. Yeah. I have a grand piano right next behind me. Um, and I just want to uh, just let you all know, my family is very musical. My, my son is a professional opera singer and my husband also writes uh, music and operetas and little sarsuelas and musicals and uh, and uh, when I built the studio I thought it would it, it had uh, the only I I built it because of the love and the support of them so I wanted them to enjoy this this place and uh, everything's on rollers you see <laughs> you, can't, you can't see all the studio but I'll kind of give it a turn it around so you can see a little bit more they're all my, you know, there's a bunch of stuff. And anyways, everything's on rollers. And that way um, uh, we put everything away in my library and then they use this place for music. And I also lend, lend these out, this studio out to young composers or conductors, uh, friends of my, of, my, of my children or my family that need a place to rehearse, especially during COVID where they couldn't get together. They would come and, and, uh, and so uh, it's a multi-use, uh, uh, you know, place here. So yeah, I'm very, oh, very so wonderful. For that. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Well, uh, Gladys, uh, I'd like for you to let us know where people can see more of your work. <laughs> well, it's on my website, uh, roldandemoras .com, and then you can follow me on Instagram at roldandemoras, and also. I have two Facebook pages. Um, one is my personal, but it's open to the public. It's Gladys, my name, Gladys Roldan de Morris, and the other one is the art of Gladys Roldan de Morris. I do have a TikTok account. I don't have anything but a real, how that real got there, I don't know, but it got on there. But, you know, um, 
I have a Twitter. I have a LinkedIn, but I don't understand LinkedIn either. So I've never been, I, once in a while I'll pop in there. And then I have that new threads and uh, I don't understand what I'm doing on threads. Uh, I think that's more than enough because it is a job. It is a time consuming. I will get up in the morning and I will post something because you have to be active. And, and anyways, we talked about that. But uh, I thank you so much for this invitation, Laura. It's been a pleasure meeting you and knowing that uh, we share a little bit of our uh, of our uh, uh, herencia colombiana. So it's a uh, very uh, wonderful and. Thank you for thinking about me, about my art. And if uh, anybody has a question, you can email or text me. And and uh, I hope you enjoyed my visit, my journey. I tried to be as much tr truthful as I could. And and uh, hopefully, you know, people enjoy it, you know? Yes, I think so. I really enjoyed it. So thank you so much, Gladys. And thank you for giving up some of your precious time to be here because I know you're busy. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. And uh, we will be in touch. Okay? Of course. Okay. <laughs>